Okay, so here's the kind of three different aspects of what was happening. So on the first one, here's your syringe. You started off at five milliliters, okay? Because at equilibrium, basically, it was the same atmospheric pressure as the room, same number of particles, right? And again, keep in mind, if you can visualize how that pressure sensor is working, that pressure sensor is working if you model the nitrogen and oxygen molecules being like this ping pong ball. And here's your pressure sensor. So every time one of those particles hits and bounces off, that creates a small amount of force. So, but if you amplify that small amount of force by billions of collisions by these oxygen and nitrogen molecules that are bouncing off, and we have, uh, we have as a society, decided we'll randomly make up a number and go, oh, we're going to call this kilopascal, okay? Could have called it squirrels, whatever, okay? We were said, okay, here's the pressure in kilopascals. So then, and again, if you, if you like this idea of modeling it as like a second grade classroom, you have a certain, you basically you have three variables. You have pressure, you have volume, you have temperature, and you have the number of kids in the classroom. Okay? So, Eli, here's that one. And just get the data. Okay. So, if you look at what's happening in this first setup, you're going to pull that plunger back. And what you should see is that your pressure is decreasing. So there's two ways you can drop the pressure. You can either have the same number of collisions with less energy because you took the Skittles away. You can drop the pressure because you just have fewer collisions, okay? Or a combination of both where you slow the kids down and you increase the volume. But if you just visualize, oh, how do we measure pressure? Oh, this little particle's bouncing off. So if you get that in your mind and you see a drop in pressure, well, how's that working? Okay, either there's less energy or there's just fewer collisions. Okay. So if you look at this in terms of PV equals NRT, we're assuming that the inert side is going to stay constant. We didn't put it in a hot water bath, we didn't put it, we didn't add, we didn't put it in an ice bath, we just kept it at room temperature. So the north side is staying the same. So it's a classic inverse relationship. Oh, volume goes up, pressure has to decrease, you're giving the kids more room, but you're not changing the number of skills. Okay? Makes sense with that. Okay. On the next, so that leads to this question on Page four, question number four, because these are all dealing with this particular question. So to give you an idea of what I want, so up there on question number one, where it says, in the first experiment, which variables from the ideal glass that were held constant and which ones were changed? All right? So you're keeping the temperature and the number of moles constant, and we're changing the pressure and the volume. Okay? Yes, they're different. So... Because of the fact that we're not changing the temperature, we're assuming that it's an isothermal. So make sure that on that graph that you pay attention to what I want the units to be in. I want the, the units for pressure to be in pascals and the volume to be in cubic meters. Okay? So make sure that you have done those conversions, pascals and the cubic meters. So what you want to do on number four is that you're going to find you're going to find the total number of moles of gas that are in the syringe. Okay. Well, to do that, you have to do a little bit of chemistry. You know the density of the gas, okay, which I gave you. You know the volume, so you got to do do some conversions, and then you have to throw in the number of moles using the molar mass because these are diatomics. So that first number of moles of nitrogen would be a horrible GPA times 10 to the negative fourth. The moles of oxygen would be a really good GPA times 10 to the fifth. And your overall number of moles would be an eh 
GPA times 10 to the negative fourth. Okay, so that's what you're going to use as the basis for number five on the other side. So that answer for num how you're going to work number five is going to use that one equals NRT natural log VI over VF. We can't use work equals negative P delta V because we're, the pressure is changing. This is not an isobaric expansion. The only time you can use work equals negative P delta V is if you have a pressure volume graph that's a horizontal line. Because basically work equals negative P delta V is saying, oh, area equals length times width. And you can only do that if you have a rectangle. This is a curved line. And so what you're trying to do is find the area underneath that curve. So that's why you have to use that natural log function and VI over VF. So anyway, so if all goes well on number five, in scientific notation, it, your answer should start with a five, if you put it in scientific notation. It should start with a five. Oh, I had a question about that as well. Like the LN thing, we, if it's like, you never need to change the units, right, because they both cancel out? Yeah, and, that, and anytime you take the natural log of anything, the units disappear. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. It has no units. So that's the only really mathematical answer that you need. The rest of them are pretty just explaining things. Yes, Marilla. Um, can we talk about number three on experiment number three? Explain the results of your graph using the ideal gas law. Can we just be like... Well, look. Okay, what does your graph look like? It's a straight line. Oh, so I just be like, oh, it's direct. That's it. Yeah. Well, look, PV equals MRT. Sorry, I had I forgot graph paper last night, so I didn't do it. I had to wait until I came so, to school look, today. So P, look, let's talk about it. PV equals MRT, right? Yeah. Okay. So what's happening on this one? Are you changing the volume on that on experiment number three? Um, no. Okay, so that's a constant. We're not changing inner R. Yes, we're not. So, so they have to both increase at the same time to be equal. Yeah, because basically if you divide that by the volume, you get pressure <laughs> equals basically a constant times the temperature, so then your function. Ah, okay. <coughs> Don, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay, <laughs> question. All right, anything else on the lab? Um. Make sure that you have labeled your graph so I know which one is which. Did you have a question? Yeah. So this graph kind of was really tiny. Yeah, you said it's fine. It. It's okay. Okay. Look, when you, especially if you're graphing something like in Kelvin, okay, come in here and do like the squiggly lines because. I didn't, I feel like you would have had an issue with this. No, 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 no. What's the squiggly Actually, lines? No, it's, it's the intelligent thing to do. Because your data, it, your data is basically in a three in a 300 to probably 350 range. So otherwise, you get all these random points in, in one small area of the graph. Yeah, that's cute. Yeah. If you didn't do it, that's fine. Okay? But... Yeah, and any time you get that big of a gap, you want to embrace that. Is this what you were saying? Okay, anything else? Mm, I don't Once, think so. twice, mm, yeah. so. Do there need to be lines Wait, on our graphs? Like? What do you mean? Should I draw a line? Connecting the dots? Yeah. Yes, that's the whole point of a graph. Oh. Wait, like this? I need a, I need a, I need a ruler. Okay. I'm making sure the nine was longer. Uh, Wait, Gracie, do they look the same? Yeah, they look exactly the same. Oh, uh, thanks, Your Gracie. Your paper stressed me out. My paper? Well, I forgot about that. Yeah, there's paper. always so many eraser marks. I just her handwriting is so dark. Okay, it's can like you so just look at it? the same, <laughs> please? Oh, wait, it's let me same, pause though. this. The money that I netted from the solar merch, the money I netted from the sale of the books, oh. and that's how much money you all have left, Nikki B. Can we do cash donations? Cash donations is fine, Venmo is fine. I don't accept children. 
I'm going to donate saying. right before my final, so, I, so you could I'm be a little saying. nice to me. So it's like, can I offer you our firstborn? No. <laughs> I've had that. <laughs> so anyway, so that's what you all have left, and that's what you get that panel up there on, on the front of the school that says, hey, first block, or third block, honors physics, fall 2022. So, so if you all, if that's what you want to do, but that's what you all have left. So, there's that. Okay. Wow. Wow. Ricky B. How much did you donate? 42. 42 so I donated 60, but you know. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. I was also bragged, though. So, did you, did you change the number? Yeah. Yay! That means five of you guys still need to donate. Oh my god, I'll donate $10. So what's left then? What's your Venmo? 100. May Solar, Solar Foundation. <laughs> okay. And that's, what's it? Alright. So here is the last topic I will teach you. Sad but true. Oh, this is what? Thank you. Mama. Knock off. Knock off. Hold on, I'm donating ten right now. Give me a fucker. Why do so many people carry cash around with them? Yeah. Let's go. I'm like. Yeah. Ten. Twelve. Yeah. Ten dollars. Who doesn't have cash? Okay. Oh wait. Wait. Oh, you're donating. Yeah, I'm donating ten right now. Seventy. I just so we better get it if I'm gonna donate. Just saying. Okay. okay without Thank you all very much. That's amazing. That is an interesting. All right. So it was cool last night. My brother, my dad has one surviving brother, and he heard about the book, and so uh, he donated five hundred dollars and says, "Hey, give me a copy of the story of my of my brother." So uh -huh. that was cool. So. Your no, you don't get the phone call. So. Uh, sorry. Does your okay. uncle look like you? All right. So when you talk about buoyancy, so this is something that if you've ever been swimming, if you've ever seen like a balloon floating, okay, you all have dealt with buoyancy. So there's a couple of things about buoyancy. Number one, this equation. Are we going, Merle? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is this equation that's on the back side of the sheet. It has FB equals rho VG. Sounds like the name of the, like a physics gang. Yo, give it up for the rho VG. So rho is density. Okay, so one of the things you're going to have to have is that sheet out that has all these different densities. Okay, that's why you have that sheet of all of those constants. So if you're in a chemistry class, that density is in grams per cubic centimeter because that's how chemists roll. In the physics class, it's still mass per unit of volume, but we use kilograms per cubic unit. V is your volume. That has to be in cubic meters. G is just a typical gravitational acceleration on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, here's what's important. That is the fluid that is being displaced in terms of the density, okay? It is not the density of the object. It's the density of the fluid. So like if you're in air, density of air is 1.20 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you have a cubic meter of air, the mass inside that cubic meter is 1.2 kilograms. You all know what one kilogram is. It's not all that much, okay? Especially if you consider a cubic meter. And that's okay that our density of our air isn't all that much. If our density was, of our air was a lot higher, okay, your fuel efficiency on your car would drop because of the fact that it would be harder to get your car to go through the, through the air, okay? Flying would actually be easier because the more dense the air is, it's easier to generate lift. So, if you, now if you compare that to water, water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So if you have a cubic meter of water, that's 1,000 kilograms. So the density of air is 1.2. Density of water is 1,000. This is why you can float on water but don't, I suggest you not try to do the backstroke in air, okay? It's not going to end well. Okay? It's like you can try it, 
not so much. Okay, so if you look at what happens with the units, so you have that density, which is in kilograms per cubic meter, multiplied by a volume in cubic meters, and then multiply that by meters per second squared. The cubic meters cancel out. You get kilograms meters per second squared, otherwise known as newtons, and a miracle happens. So this combination of rho v is what's going to get you the mass of the object. Okay, so rho v by itself is just mass. Multiply it by g, boom, there you go. So here's a simple example. So here we have yonder hydrogen filled balloon. Okay. Wait, is the row, is that density? Yes. Okay. So, what you so want to remember about buoyancy, it is the weight of the fluid that is displaced. It is not the weight of the object, okay? It's the weight of the fluid that's being displaced. So, here I have a hydrogen-filled balloon, okay? Not helium, sorry. <coughs> By the way, if you haven't heard, speaking of helium and hydrogen, the uh, Department of Energy just released a statement that, according to their calculations, they've actually achieved uh, a fusion process here on Earth that actually generates more energy than it consumes. Uh, so the short version of what's happening there, the very short version, which is normally an hour-long lecture, is that you're taking four hydrogen atoms and you're combining them into one helium, Okay, and there's a slight difference in mass. That helium has slightly less mass than the hydrogen does. And so that difference in mass, you plug into Einstein's equation of E equals mc squared. So, and C is the speed of light, which is like 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So as soon as you square that, you're like nine times 10 to the 16th. So it doesn't take very much mass difference to produce a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, so if we can actually get that going, it is an absolute game changer because if we can get that to work on a sustained process, the problem is it takes really, 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 really high temperatures and extremely high pressures because the hydrogens don't like each other because you're trying to force two protons together, okay? So Wait. that's why it's so tough to do. But if we can do it, we'll basically we have an unlimited supply of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And our only byproduct of it is helium. Okay? <laughs> so you could basically, if you could get this going, you could effectively shut down every coal, gas, plant in the world that generates electricity. And your only byproduct is helium. So this is the first time they've ever actually been able to have a net gain or net production of electricity. Before, you, always, you could do it, but you always had to put more energy in than what you got out. This one, you actually have a net output of energy that then you can use to heat water, make steam, spin a turbine, and then I get to make toast. So. Wait, what happens to the other two protons? Huh? They come together? Yeah. So basically, the two two protons end up as two neutrons, and that's where you, that's where the mass loss occurs, and that's what gets converted into energy. So are they hydrogen ions then? No, no, well, it, it's, it depends upon the process where you, you actually you use deuterium and tritium. Like I said, this, this is the short version of an hour-long lecture, okay? Just accept that you're taking hydrogen, you're making it into helium, and you're getting energy out of it. That's cool. Okay. All right. So, here I have a hydrogen-filled balloon. So let's say that the volume of the balloon, just to make the math easy, is, uh, I don't know, 0.2 cubic meters. So if I want to find the buoyant force created by that balloon, I'd go, okay, my density, now this is not the density of the hydrogen inside the gas, it is the density of air. So if you look on, here where you have different densities, okay? So density of air, 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's gonna be 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter times 0.2 cubic meters times G. So somebody run the numbers, take 1.29 times 0.2 times G.
Oh, wait. Or something. Uh, yeah, I got 2.53. Okay, 2.53 meters. Okay? So, that upward force is 2.53 newtons. So, why then isn't it lifting up that one kilogram mass? What does a one kilogram mass weigh? 9.8 newtons. newtons. So I have an upward force of 2.53, but a downward force of 9.8. Now, if I take this and let go of it, then what's going to happen? Then it accelerates upward, because now I don't have any opposing force acting on it. So this is where you can get the net force and other things. Now, even if I put like a binder clip on it, okay, like so, okay, so now what do you know about the weight of the binder clip? Greater than the, the, the yeah. force points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like you can watch gravity in slow motion, okay? So, but here's the point. When you look at the buoyant force, focus on the balloon. Now, let's say hypothetically, and they're fairly close. So here's Hank, okay? So let's say that Hank and the balloon, let's just say, they have the same volume, okay? The balloon's a little bit bigger. Let's just say in round numbers, let's say it's the same, okay? Not a huge difference. So which one has a greater buoyant force? The balloon, Hank, or is it the same? Hank. Hank has a greater buoyant force. I feel like he would because he has a greater density, maybe. Oh, it's the air that's being the density. Never mind, yeah, it's the same. Why is it the same? Because the air, the object. Okay, because it's the weight of the fluid that is displaced. Okay, it is not the density of the object. So this balloon and Hank both have the exact same buoyant force if the volume is the same. But then here's the million dollar question. If I let go of Hank, he drops like a rock. If I let go of the balloon, up, up, and away. Same buoyant force. What's the difference? What about gravity? Okay. So here's Hank. Here's the balloon. They both have the exact same buoyant force, right? What's the difference? Which, which one weighs more? Hank. So with this one, the gravitational force pulling down on Hank is greater than the buoyant force. On this one with the balloon, the buoyant force, there's still a little bit of gravity pulling down because there's some hydrogen. I mean, it has mass, okay? There's a little bit of downward force, okay? There's a little bit of gravity acting on it, but not very much. So, Hank sinks in air because the gravitational force is greater than the buoyant force. Okay. Now, let's say that... I have bowling ball and the golf ball. Okay, and let, again, let's just let's just assume that they have the same volume. Okay, so which one will have the greater buoyant force? The balloon, <laughs> the ping pong ball. I was looking up at the balloon. The ping pong ball or the golf ball? Same. Same buoyant force. But if I put the ping pong ball in water, it floats. If I put the golf ball in water, it sinks. So why does the ping pong ball float and the golf ball sinks? Yeah, what is it? Let's start with the ping pong ball. So here's the cup. There's the water. There's the ping pong ball, right? That's the amount that's below the water line. 
Now, the ping pong ball is sitting there. Is the ping pong ball accelerated? No. No, it's not. So all the forces add up to? Zero. So what are the two forces acting on the ping pong ball? Buoyant force and force gravity. So you have buoyant force acting up, right? Then you have gravity pulling down. It's floating. If you've ever been swimming, okay, which I'm guessing the vast majority of you have, you all have floated, okay? <laughs> Okay, anyway, back to our story. So when you float or anything floats, when anything floats, you have two forces involved. You have buoyant force acting down, and you have the gravitational force acting up. Now, If I push the ping pong ball down, what happens to the buoyant force? Does it increase, decrease, or stay the same when I push that down? How many of the buoyant force just stays the same? I'm going to push it down. Okay? Right? So now it's going to be down here like this. Okay? So how many of the buoyant force just stays the same? Is your body a fluid? It's <laughs> <laughs> a personal question. <laughs> no, like you're pushing down on it, so I don't know if that counts as like the displaced, you know? Like the Is your body a fluid? <laughs> He's definitely going to miss this class. It's the bonus oh, no. physics teacher. <laughs> oh, well, like, because you're pushing down on it. I don't know if that counts as the fluid that is displaced. Oh, yeah. You're not surrounding it. You're not displacing the water. I'm not, I'm not absorbing the ping pong ball into my body. Okay, fine. It was a dumb question. Never mind. There's no dumb questions. There's no dumb questions in here. <laughs> that was, that, that was cool. <laughs> Here, here's the border. She had one foot over. There. Okay. So here's the drill. Okay. Look at how you calculate buoyant force. Buoyant force is rho v g. So when I push it down, am I changing the density of the water? No. No. It's a fixed value. Am I changing little g? No. no. Am I changing the volume that's submerged? Yes. 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 So, as I push it down, what's happening to the buoyant force? It's increasing. It's increasing. But when I let go of it, what, is the, what does it do? It's back up. It's back up. Right? So, has anybody gone swimming and tried to, like, hold a beach ball underneath the water. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Tough to do. Why? Because it wants to, it wants to pop back up. Right? It wants to pop back up. Why? Which is bigger? The, when I push that down, what becomes bigger? The buoyant force or the gravitational force? The buoyant force. The buoyant force is. So when I let go of it, what happens? It goes, back to normal. goes up, right? Now, but when I put the bowling ball, in, excuse me, when I put the golf ball in, what did it do? Sink. It sank because the gravitational force was greater than the buoyant force. Now, when something is floating, this is a huge if. When something is floating, there are only two forces involved. Count them two people. Gravitational force and the buoyant force. Now we're going to do a little bit of algebraic hocus pocus. Okay? Just a little bit. So we're going to set the buoyant force equal to the gravitational force. Okay? Now our buoyant force is going to be rho V G. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also said Wade. Rho V Wade. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, every single time you say Two-way that. Two-way across the Delaware River. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> subtle. <but> subtle. <laughs> okay. So. Never heard it. Okay. So that row is what? The density of the object or the density of the fluid? Fluid. This is the density of the fluid. Okay. Now, is that volume the total volume or the volume that's below the surface? Below surface. That's the volume that is submerged, and then we have G, right? Now, FG, here's, the, here's where this, this happens. If I want the, and we're, I'm going to assume that this is a uniform density. Okay, so we assume that it's like a chunk of wood, okay? So I need the weight of this, which means I need the entire mass of this. So this is going to be the density of the object, okay, whatever that is. If it's wood, it's going to be like 0 0.8, 0 0.6, something like that, times the volume. Now, that volume has to be the entire volume. Because we're trying to find basically the mass of this object that we can multiply by g. So on the buoyancy side, it's the density of the fluid times only the volume that is below the surface. Not the entire volume, because what's above doesn't matter. It's only what's below. Times g. This is the entire density of the object times the entire volume of the object, because what we're trying to find is the mass of that object. So this would be like this block of wood, whatever that is, times g. Since there's an equality sign there, what's going to happen to the g's? Cancel. Bye-bye. Those go bye-bye. Now, we're going to do a little bit of sleight of hand. Plus. I'm going to take the density of the fluid, divide that by the density of the object, and then I'm going to have the on this side, then I'm going to have the, whoa, go away. I have no idea what that happened. Okay? So I'm going to take the density. No, I screwed that up. My bad. I want to work this. Hold on. That is. It's like this is not going to end well. So. Okay, so here's the deal. So when something floats, like for example, wood, right? So what do you know about the density of wood relative to the density of water? It's smaller. It's less dense, right? Yeah. Okay. So this number over here is going to be less than one. So if it's got, something's going to float, the density of the object has to be less than the density of the fluid. Over here, because there's an equality sign, this is what's going to be important. So here's the deal. If I want to get an estimate of the density of this ping pong ball, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in the water, and I'm going to see how much of that volume is below the water line. So if I'm just looking at this, okay, let's say there's 20% of the volume of the ping pong ball that's below the water line. Okay. So that's going to be about 20%, okay? Ballpark, it's about 20%. So what that means is that the density of the fluid, which is water, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So what does that mean that the density of the ping pong ball is? About 20%. About 20% of that, which would be? About 200. About 200 kilograms <laughs> per cubic meter, right? Because 20 is 2 over, 20 over 100, right? So I lop off a zero, that's 20 over 100. Oh, yes. So if I can get an idea when something's floating, what the, what, how much of that volume is submerged, that's going to tell me what the density of that fluid is without, being, without having to measure. So for those of you that have floated, okay? Ballpark estimate. 
How much of your body is below the waterline? Rough estimate. About what? You have, really, that's, that you're on ice. So you're like hovering. Assuming that you're in liquid water, not ice. What do you get? Small part. 70. Okay. So let's say about 70% of your body is below the waterline. Okay? So what that means then, if 70% of your body is below the waterline, that means the average density of the human body is 700 kilograms per cubic meter. So the percentage that's below the waterline has to equal the density of that object. Now, that only works when something floats. Okay? That only works when something floats. When things don't float, it's a whole new ballgame. So let's shut that down and we Hi, Kaylee, we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the setup that we have. We have an iron block suspended by a Newton scale and it's reading 2.54 newtons. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to lower that block into the water. Okay? So three things can happen to the reading on the scale. It can just stay the same because when I lower it into the water, gravity is still pulling down on it. It's still going to be 2.54 newtons. Okay? The reading on the scale could increase because now that it's an additional buoyant force acting on it that's pulling it down. Or the reading on the scale to decrease because the buoyant force is helping to lift it up. Okay, so those are your three options. So the first time I'm going to lower it just so it's about halfway submerged. Okay, so those are your choices. That 2.54 newtons, which is an upward reading on the scale, systems in equilibrium, it's going to go up to maybe 2.64. It's going to just stay at 2.54 because gravity is still pulling it down. Or it's going to become smaller, maybe like 2.44. So increase, decrease, stay the same. So how many think the reading on the scale is going to go up? Yeah. I don't know. No. I'm, 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 You're on the up train. I'm going with the up. Wait, are the Newton? Are, how do these measured again? Is it there's? No, 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 no. You know how when we would? Let us just vote. Let's just. I don't think. No, things things are lighter in water. Okay, let's continue. So, so is anybody else on the up train? Like that scale is going to go up to like two point six four. Absolutely not. I just goes to. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. No, no, we're just going half. Okay. Halfway. Can't change your mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm You're sticking on the up train. That's okay. Wow. Okay. So, how many votes? The reading on the scale is just going to stay the same. Won't change at all. Okay, how many vote the reading on the scale is going to become less? Okay, so Gracie, why did you vote less? <laughs> because there will be the force going up to counteract it, the gravity force, the buoyant what force. What force acting up? The buoyant force. Created by it being submerged in yeah. water. Fluid. Now, is there a buoyant force acting on it now? Yes. Yes. There is. Oh, yeah, there is. There is a buoyant force acting on it now. Okay? Oh, yeah, Why is there a buoyant force acting on it now? Air. Air. Air is displacing oh, air. Yeah. Air right? molecules. So right now, there's a buoyant force acting on all of us. Okay? Because we all are displacing air. Okay? Don't get cocky in your college application. Go, what's your senior year? I displace air. I it looks kind of like, you know. Like okay. So, let's see the moment of truth. Okay. So we'll lower it about halfway. <laughs> and we dropped to 2.49. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Okay. So the reading on the scale became less. So think about this. What's happened to the volume that's submerged in that dense fluid? Once I put it in the water, that volume is getting bigger, right? Yeah. I'm not changing the density of water. I'm not changing the gravitational acceleration. So the further I lower it, the buoyant force is going to get more, more right? Okay. 
Okay. Oh Wayne forces it to get bigger. So we'll lower it some more. Okay. And now we're about seven eighths of the way submerged, and we're down into the two point three. So we were at two point five four. Now we're at two point three. Is the system still in equilibrium? Yeah. Do all the forces add up to equal to zero? Yes. So there's three forces involved. What are the three forces involved? Gravity. Gravity pulling down, which is still what? Whatever that is. 2.54 newtons. Gravity is still pulling down 2.54 newtons. Right. Cool with that. Is there any other force acting downward? No. No, that's it. Gravity is pulling it down. There's two forces acting up. And those two forces acting up have to add up to 2.54. So molecular forces. the scale is reading 2.30. So the upward tension on the string is 2.30 newtons. So what's the value of the buoyant force? 0.24. Because those two values, if I add all those together, random bit of excess finish on the bottom of the table. So if I add everything together, it's going to add up to equal to zero. So if you consider gravity oh, being negative 2.54, you've got 2.30 plus the tension 0.24, everything adds up to equal to zero. Now the next step, I'm going to completely submerge the weight. I'm going to put it completely below the water level. What's going to happen to the reading on the scale? Will it go to zero, or will there still be some tension? Acting upward. Are you going to submerge the hook? Yes. Yeah, like, will the, will the string still be a little bit taut like that? Or will it be a little wrinkly? It's 2.54 newtons. I thought we are putting it all the way down. So I'm going to put this whole thing under water. But like... I still think like, oh, you mean so it's, so it's just covered by water? No, no, it's all... All the way the to the bottom of the beaker? Deep. It's going deep. No, the hook is all the way in. Wait, oh. it's sitting on the glass. So it'll so still be on there. So I'm going to lower this down. I won't let it touch the bottom. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Then yes, there will be some weight. It's still going to be tension. Yeah. Okay. So you have to be more this. specific. Yeah, there's still tension. Yeah, it don't, it don't float. <laughs> that's, that's our quote for today. It don't float. God loves your English teachers. Okay, so the scale is now 2.22 newtons. It was 2.54, so what's the value of the buoyant force? Uh, point, uh, 2.54 minus 2.2. Yeah, so your buoyant force is 0.32. The downward force acting down, the difference between those, there's your buoyant force. Got it? Good? Back to you. Can I turn in my assignment, hopefully? Yeah, you were up there when I was up there. Okay, guys. Okay. So if something is more dense than the fluid that's being submerged in, you have three forces involved. You have gravity pulling it down, right? Which can either be mg, or it could be rho vg. But again, that's the density of the object, okay? That is not, you have to keep these things straight. That is the density of the object, the volume that's below mg, okay? So this is for the object, okay? Got that acting down. So you've got some buoyant force acting up, okay? And that buoyant force is also gonna be rho Vg, but that is gonna be the density of the fluid. That's gonna be the volume that is submerged, and that's just gonna be G, okay? So your buoyant force is going to be different than your gravitational force, okay? So clearly, which one's going to be bigger if you have to keep a string to keep something from... Yeah, the gravitational force has to be bigger than that. So the tension on the string 
is the difference between those two. So if your gravitational force, let's make the math easy, you say is 10 newtons, and you measure the tension on the string to be 7 newtons, what's the value of your buoyant force? 3 newtons. Okay, so that way everything adds up to <coughs> 0. If you really wanted to get fancy, you'd make that negative 10. Okay? Now, if something is less dense, so let's say, for example, I'm going to take this ping pong ball and I'm going to submerge it. Okay? So it's completely submerged. As soon as I let go of it, what's going to happen? It's going to bounce up, right? So when that's fully submerged, which direction is the force that I have to supply to keep it below the water line? Downward. Downward. But over there, with that steel cube, the force that I had to apply to keep it from sinking was acting up. Okay? So if it's less dense than the fluid, okay, then here's the beaker, here's the object, then I have to keep it anchored down so that it doesn't float. Okay? So if that's the case, then I'm still going to have gravity pulling it down. Now I'm going to have a buoyant force. So if something wants to go up, which one's bigger, the buoyant force or the gravitational force? Buoyant. The buoyant force is. So now, so in this situation, the tension is going to act in which direction? Down. Downward. So now when I take the tension and the gravitational force and add those together, that's going to equal the buoyant force. buoyant force acting up. Now, if it's neutrally buoyant, and the density of the object is the exact same as the density of the fluid, it's just going to float. So if, you, if you've ever seen the fish down at the end of the hallway, okay? Yeah. We don't have little strings on the fish to keep them from <laughs> sinking, to be awkward. It's like, okay? What's the density? Is it fish fluid? Okay? So, but fish can sink and rise. How do they do that? Their air gills. Oh! They alter the amount of air inside their system. So if they want to go up, what do they do to their overall density? Lower it. Lower it. If they want to oh, sink, they raise it. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh -huh. So that they sink. So that's how they control it. It's, it's called a little bladder in there, and that's what controls their buoyancy. And that's what allows them to rise and sink. Because if they couldn't control it, okay, like let's say, for example, if fish were always less dense than water, what would the fish do? They'd always float on top. Okay? Now, if their, if their density was a lot more than water, they'd always just sink to the bottom. Wait, so then, did a flying fish? No, 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 that's, 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 that's something completely different. Okay, got the idea. All right, so stop that. So here's the deal. So you need to reference, like, these different densities. You have to have that handy. Uh, so, like, on number six, or even on number five, when I say, what does something weigh, am I asking for kilograms or am I asking for newtons? Newtons. newtons. If I wanted kilograms, what would I ask for? The mass. Mass. Keep that in mind. <laughs> when you get to number eight, I kind of take you through this step by step by step. Okay? You got a piece of copper, certain volume. I'm going to drop it into a graduate and so on. Okay? Now, remember... When something is displacing water, the volume of the water that it displaces is equal to the volume of the object. Okay? So keep that in mind. When you get to number nine, so you have liquid mercury, which, oh, in the good old days, like my high school chemistry teacher would literally like, uh, he had a jar, of, it was like a baby food jar full of liquid mercury. And if we got done with the test, he'd like literally pour it out on the table and we would like 
push it around. It's the coolest thing. You can't do that anymore. They completely flip out of you. <laughs> I mean, they, they were literally like calling the hazmat team. And I'm going, I survived. <laughs> so, so, you have liquid mercury. Liquid mercury is incredibly dense, okay? And you're going to put an aluminum bar on top of it. It's going to float. So what do you know about the two forces? Um, They're equal. Okay? Which one is this? Keep that in mind. Now, when you get to number 10, here is the crane, and here is the water level, and you are lifting up this piece of steel that's down below the water line. Okay? So, you're going to have three forces involved. You're going to have weight pulling it down, you're going to have your buoyant force, and then you're going to have the tension on the cable. Okay? Now, to do this, you have to have the volume of the steel. You don't have the volume of the steel. I gave you the mass of the steel. Okay? But knowing the mass of the steel, and the density of the steel, which is on your sheet, what could you find? Volume. The volume of the steel. Okay? Once you know the volume of the steel, then you can find the buoyant force. Now, as soon as that clears the water, what's going to happen to the tension on that cable? It's going to increase. To the it's going to increase. Why? Um, because there's no more buoyant force. You've lost has... the buoyant force. Yeah. So if you've ever gone fishing and you've tried to like land a big fish, as soon as you pull that fish out of the water, the weight on your line increases because you've lost that buoyant force. Now this is also relevant to those of you that are that are into biology. So you have sea turtles, right? Really cool. Oddly enough, they live in the sea, hence the term sea turtles. Catchy title. Now, where do sea turtles go to lay their eggs? The beach. On land. So they're used to being neutrally buoyant. And they have little flippers, and they work great for being in the ocean. You get them up on land, what happens to the weight of the turtles? What happens to the weight of the turtles? Stays the exact same. What happens to the buoyant force? It's gone. Gone. No, there's air. There's air, but not much. Right? So now the, the, these turtles, right, they're going, wow, we're no longer neutrally buoyant. So those flippers, it's really, really hard for those turtles to go up on the beach because of the fact they have lost that buoyancy, okay? So now it's, that's why it's such a struggle for those turtles to move because of the fact they've spent their entire lives being neutrally buoyant, and now all of a sudden you lose that buoyant force, and now you're up on dry land. So that's why it's so difficult for sea turtles to get in and out. Okay, all right, I'm done. You're on your own. Okie dokie.